Bibles with you, open them up to the book of Ephesians, all right? Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 6. Listen, a couple of weeks ago, probably about a month now, the Lord interrupted me in the middle of my seeking Him and really gave me a mandate and said, Michael, I want to establish a culture of hospitality in River of Love. God has given us a mandate to create a culture of hospitality. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It really does. And so I thought, well, that's wonderful. I think we're pretty hospitable as a group of people, but how many of you know we all have room to grow? You know what I'm saying? We've got room to grow. And so we started this series on uh, Valentine's Day, amen? And uh, we started with a series, or a, a sermon entitled, I Choose You. And we saw that one of the keys to developing a culture of hospitality is having a mindset that constantly says, I choose you. Marcus, I choose you. Okay. And in uh, John chapter 15, verse 5, I believe, Jesus said that you did not choose me, but I chose you you, okay? And so in our relationships, most of the time as we develop a new relationship, we choose someone, but then after a, a period of time in the relationship, we begin to, people begin to see our weaknesses and our faults, and so our I choose you turns into a question, and we begin to ask, do you choose me? Do you still choose me? And you see, as long as we're living our lives with, an, with a do you choose me mentality, guess what? Nobody's being chosen. And we set ourselves up for unhealthy relationships. And so part of creating a culture of hospitality is, is constantly recognizing that we are chosen and that we have the ability and the responsibility to continue to choose others. All right? The following week, we, we looked at the word hospitality a little bit more. And, you know, we discovered that here in America, when we talk about hospitality, it's kind of like inviting your friends over and rolling out the red carpet, right? And getting out the, the good china and just having a, a good season of having someone over. And, and listen, on one level, that is hospitality. But when we took a look at the word hospitality in the Greek, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce this morning, but when we looked at it, we saw that the definition of hospitality has to do specifically, does anybody remember? It has to do with loving a stranger as a dear friend, okay? So if we're just inviting our friends and we're just fellowshipping with the people that we know, are we practicing hospitality? No. What's that called? That's called friendship. That's called fellowship. That's called fellowship. So when we are, are engaging strangers and we're treating strangers as a dear friend, literally by the Greek definition, that's what hospitality is. So when God says, I want you to create a culture of hospitality, what does that mean to you? You know, that doesn't mean that we're just going to it's not gonna, we're not going to be an us for and no more church, you know. Me and my friend and his two acquaintances. No, we're a church that is going to treat strangers like dear friends, all right? How many of you will be on board for that? Yes. Amen. That means when you look around this room, everybody that you see, you have the opportunity to say, I choose you. Okay, and then to have corresponding actions that continue to say that. And then we treat strangers as a dear friend. Amen? All right. So today, I want to kind of build on that, and we're going to talk about being accepted in the beloved. All right. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, and this I'm going to read this out of the King James. It says, um, well, let's see if I need to back up. I'm going to start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in the beloved. That's a part of creating a culture of hospitality, all right? Because we all want to be accepted. Is there anybody here that doesn't want to be accepted? I mean, you just feel like you've got cooties. <laughs> you know, I remember when I was in school, you know, I, I, some, if you're old enough, you know, we had cooties when I was in school. <clears throat> and if you had them, you weren't accepted. <laughs> you were pretty well rejected and everybody stayed away from you. But inside of the heart of every individual, we all want to be accepted. There's no individual on the face of this earth that isn't crying out at the deepest levels of their heart to be accepted on some level or another. And we don't want to just be tolerated. We don't want to be accepted just like your taxes to the IRS. Okay? Have any of you got these little emails that say that your taxes have been accepted by the IRS? That's not the type of accept... Not, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Hoping for it tomorrow, right? But that's not the type of acceptance that we're talking about. We're talking about an entirely different level of being accepted. When you look in the Greek... That, the, that little phrase, accepted in the beloved, comes from two Greek words. One is, and I will try this, it's karatu, and it's where we get the word grace, okay? Grace is, is the root word there, and the word beloved is the word agapeo. It's where we get the word agape, all right? So to be accepted in the beloved literally means this. It means the overwhelming pleasure of God to unconditionally embrace you. How many of you kind of get a sense of what it means to be accepted in the beloved when, when I say it is God's... If, if you met somebody, you know, if, if Adam, if, if I just... Well, not, probably you're not the best example. Melanie, stand up. You're a better example. Okay. If I have an overwhelming... If it's my overwhelming pleasure, it's my overwhelming pleasure to embrace her unconditionally. <laughs> Woo! I might have to sit down, but, uh, <laughs> but we need a picture. We need a, a, a picture of what it means. Can you see God pursuing you? He so accepted you that he, his overwhelming desire is to embrace you. I know way too many people who have an entirely different picture of God. That idea is so foreign because the only thing that they can embrace is the picture of a distant, wrathful, unknowable, unapproachable God. And you can read, if that's your picture, if that's the mindset that you have of God, you will never, ever be able to accept the truth that you are accepted in the beloved. You've got to, you've got to know that. More than just accepted, the Father is pleased. He's pleased to accept you. So who is the beloved? Hmm? Jesus is the beloved, right? I'm so glad that it di didn't just say that, you know, Paul just didn't say that, that he made us accepted in Christ. That's true, but he chose to use an entirely different word to convey something to you and I that we are accepted not just in Christ legally and positionally, but we are accepted in the beloved, and the beloved is Christ. In um, Matthew chapter 3, I want, I want to look at something here because was Jesus the beloved? Why was Jesus the beloved? Was it because... Was it because of his miracles? Was it because of... His going to the cross? Was Jesus the beloved of the Father because of anything that he did? 
See, we get a clue of this in Matthew chapter 3. Jesus was 30 years old, and he had come to a place where he was going to begin his public ministry. And so he comes to John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and he's baptized. And the heavens open, and the Spirit of God descends like a dove, and the voice of the Father comes and says, this is my, what? Beloved Son, in Him I am well pleased. How many miracles had Jesus performed? None. How many sermons had He taught? How many people did Jesus win to Jesus? <laughs> hey. <laughs> None. So, the Father spoke these words... You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. But he hadn't done anything. Is your ability to receive the love of God based on your performance? Or is it based on your value as a son or a daughter of the Most High God? Okay? Our, accepted is, our, our acceptance in the beloved is not based on what we do. It's not based on whether you're having a good day or a bad day. Okay? I want to read something. How many of you know Charles Spurgeon? One of, one of the greatest pastors that's ever lived. He wrote this. I, I don't know how I found this on the web. And I, I can't even paraphrase it any better, so I'm just going to read it. Listen to this and see if you can relate to this. Some Christians seem to be accepted in their own experience. When their spirit is lively and their hopes bright, they think God accepts them, for they feel so high, so heavenly-minded, so drawn above the earth. But when their souls cleave to the dust, they are victims of the fear that they are no longer accepted. If they could but see that all their high joys do not exalt them, and all their low despondencies do not really depress them in the Father's sight, but that they stand accepted in one who never alters, in one who is always the beloved of God, always perfect, always without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. What do you think of that? How many of you can relate to that? You're having a good day. You've had your devotions. You had a worship time. You really sense the presence of God in your life. So therefore, as a result of that, I feel accepted today. Come on. Anybody, anybody there? How about those days when you get up and you feel like a worm? When you feel like, you, like, like you've been run over by the treads of every Mack truck or vehicle on I-95. It's hit you. Okay? You get up on those days and your emotions are just saying, this sucks. <laughs> you know? What did, what did I do wrong? On those days, do we allow how we feel and the circumstances, our performance? On those days, you didn't do your devotions. You didn't read your Bible. You stopped in the middle of a song because you didn't feel like singing the rest of it. You might have even said something that you shouldn't say. <laughs> Naughty Christians. <laughs> On those days, under those circumstances, are you accepted in the beloved? How many of you are saying that up here, but you're questioning it down here? How many of you are saying the right words, but you're not really sure what the score of the music is? <laughs> I, I want to say I, but even more than I, God wants you to know that you are accepted in the beloved. You are accepted in Christ, not based on your behavior, not based on how high a day or how well your circumstances are going. You are entirely, always, never, without fail, accepted in the beloved because of who you are. Come on. How many of you have kids and you only accept them when they do the right thing. You disown them. <laughs> Keep those hands down. <laughs> well. 
We're talking about your two-year-old child, <laughs> okay? The two-year-old child who doesn't clean his room, doesn't do his laundry. Yeah. Well, that's exactly, exactly. That, that's really the point that I'm making, is that if we want to use a standard of performance to dictate whether or not we're accepted, can I tell you that bar is way high? Even on your best day, we fail. <laughs> but we're accepted because we are the beloved. He loves you so much. I want that to get really, really personal this morning. I want that to become uncomfortably personal this morning. I want you to, to feel the love of God, His overwhelming pleasure, to lavish you with his goodness, his mercy, and his love. You need to know that. That's his default setting. That never changes. And the more that we grow in him, the more we come to the realization that those aren't just nice words. It's the reality of our relationship with Almighty God. Isn't that crazy? I love it. And I'm behind. But that's okay. So, do we have to clean up our act? Did we have to clean up our act before we came to Him? Are we the beloved only when we live right, talk right, and do right? I don't know if any of you remember the cartoon. Any, I was thinking about Dudley Do Right. <laughs> Shows some, some age, him and his, his little horse called horse. <laughs> of course. But listen, we live our lives as if we have to do right to be accepted in the beloved. Our performance is never the barometer of your acceptance in the beloved. Our performance stems from a revelation that we're loved. Okay. In a long time in too many churches where we do the right things because we believe that if we do right, then we will be accepted. And if you don't do right, guess what? The entire, the entire church is there to condemn you and to tell you that you're not right, but you need to get right. And until you do get right, you're... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're wrong, but not only are you wrong, but you're probably going to, um, what's the word that I'm thinking of? You're going to quench the spirit. You know, don't let a sinner roll up into a church service because they'll sure enough quench the spirit of God. God can't handle that. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but listen, our performance stems from the revelation that we're loved. When you get a revelation of how loved you are, it will motivate you more than anything else to live holy. You see? Not because we have to, but we want to be like our Father. We want to be like our Daddy God. Amen? And we get to, because He's called us to that. So we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, particularly verse 2, says that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Can I tell you this? That that transformation takes place after you're born again, not before. The transformation, you don't get transformed and then come to Christ. You come as you are, you're accepted in the beloved, and his love and his word changes and transforms us. What does that transformation look like? This was something the Lord just popped in my spirit this morning. Oh, I don't even know what I wrote. <laughs> okay. As, as our minds are transformed, we become to a great, we come to a greater and greater revelation of his unconditional love for you and for others. Maturity in Christ, it comes to a place where you're, 
your bubble stays in the center. It, it, it's not about learning more about what the Bible says, even though that's extremely important. But it's coming to a place deep in the core of yourself where what happens on the outside around you and what's happening in you does not affect you because you know that the one who loves you more than anything, that's all that it takes. Does that make any sense? That's the greatest revelation that we can get. Creating a culture of hospitality demands that we receive from God the same unconditional love and acceptance that is freely given. Hello? Maturity means that we accept that, that we receive that, and then in turn, we give that to others. Isn't that nice? You can't give something away that you first haven't received on your own. All right? You'll never bring anybody into a greater revelation of God's love than you're embracing on your own. If you know that you're accepted in the beloved up here, you can tell somebody that. If you know it here, you can show it, you can impart it. That's what God wants to bring you and I into a greater, everybody say greater, a greater awareness of our acceptance in the beloved. If God's called us to create a culture of hospitality, we've got to know that at the very core of who we are. Otherwise, we're going to come across as hypocrites to the rest of the community because we haven't got the revelation of our own. All right? All we know are the words, but there is no music. So that's what Jesus did, right? That's what he did for us. He accepted us, not based on our performance, but based on his value of who we are as being created in his image and likeness. Is this the standard of accepting others, treating others as a dear friend? Is that only reserved for people who are socially acceptable? Okay. Do we accept others based on their race, their sexuality, religious beliefs? Or do we accept them the way that Christ accepted them? My question is, do we or don't we? Okay. I, want, I just want to challenge us here this morning. What God spoke to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, verse 5, where he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I've appointed you. For Jeremiah, it was to be a prophet to the nations. But can I say that those words are true for every individual in this room? They're true for every individual on the face of this planet. Okay? God knows us. He has a plan. He's appointed us. But the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving. They don't recognize the gift that they are. Okay? They don't recognize that they've been accepted. Many of them are looking to be accepted. And they're finding different places to be accepted because they don't feel accepted in the church. Okay? So do we accept others based on what? based on their race, their sexuality, their religious beliefs. Let's look at Jesus for a moment. This is amazing to me when I look at Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, my link didn't work, so I have to go there manually. Matthew 9, 11. Well, I'm going to start at verse 9. Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners 
came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why is Jesus doing this? Would we be willing to do that? When's the last time that you had dinner with tax collectors? <laughs> yeah, maybe H&R Block or TurboTax. But <laughs> When's the last time you had dinner with a sinner? Amen? Just a thought. In uh, Matthew 11, Jesus kind of responds... to the religious people who are coming against him. And he says, talking about John the Baptist, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard, a friend, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Speaking of Jesus, I mean, there are so many scriptures, Luke 15 too, but the Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling and saying, this man receives sinners and even eats with them. Kick him out of the church. Kick him out of the synagogue. Paul said this in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. See, did Jesus come with his whip and take it against the sinners and say, get out of this temple, you sinner? Who did Jesus bring that rebuke to? It was the Pharisees, it was the religious leaders who were taking the very temple of God and turning it into a den of thieves, right? They were just looking to make a buck, right? Sell some doves and sheep. But over and over, the Scripture makes it plain that if we're to develop a culture of hospitality, that we've got to learn to treat a stranger as a dear friend. And how many of you know sinners are strangers, especially if you've been saved by more, by, for more than a couple of years. Because the average Christian, after they've been saved about a year, has no relationship, no friendships outside of the church or out non-Christian sinner friends. Hello? Anybody in the room? <laughs> Anybody resemble that? I want to look um, at one particular story that we can draw some conclusions from. And again, I'm sharing these things because God is challenging us. He's given us a mandate to create a culture of hospitality. I saw the hands at the beginning of the message. They were up. All right. How many of you still on board? All right, cool. Cool. But, you know, we just can't lay hands and make a declaration and say, we declare we have a culture of hospitality. How many of you know this thing has to be lived out? How many of you know some mindsets have to change? Okay. We've got to begin to embrace our community the way that Christ embraced the community. Right? And that's going to involve some changes, and things might look a little bit messy to some religious folk. Can I say that just up front? It might. It will. I promise you. Let's look at Jesus in a situation in John chapter 8. Okay? You see, you're going to fall into one of two camps. We're either going to be Jesus with the sinners that we come in contact in life, or we're going to be a religious leader. One or the other. Okay. Some people have a default setting that you're accepted in the beloved. 
Some people have a default setting of, I am going to judge your performance and I will accept you if your performance is right, but I will reject you just as quick if your performance isn't right. Anybody ever meet anybody like that? Anybody ever look in the mirror and see anybody like that? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm not alone. So, uh, John chapter 8. Is everybody doing okay for a few minutes? Still here this morning? Okay. John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? How many of you believe that the scribes and Pharisees were creating a culture of hospitality? <laughs> okay. Okay. Pretty plain. This woman didn't just come up and say, hey, I'm sorry, I was feeling, I, I feel convicted. I just want to announce that I, I'm caught in the act of adultery. Take me to your leaders. Stone me. All right, that wasn't what happened. I, I probably could guess that there was probably a Pharisee or a religious leader involved in the act of adultery themselves. Okay. So they came to, to Jesus and said, what do you say? And they were saying this to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. See, the religious leaders had already come with the death sentence. They were coming, trying to trick Jesus, because if Jesus upheld the law of Moses and said, stone her, well, then the people would turn against him. But at the same time, if Jesus said, no, we're just going to accept her. Everything's okay. Let's just be kind and nice. Then they would say, but what about the law of Moses? So it seems like kind of a catch-22, doesn't it? But how many of you know Jesus always has a word? He always has the last word. He always has the truth. And the truth has a way of showing us the dark areas of our heart and revealing the truth so that we can have that opportunity to walk in light. Amen? So, when the religious people came and they brought this accusation, they said, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. Moses, the law of Moses says, says what? Says, stoner, why? Because what's, what's the law that she broke? One of the Ten Commandments? Which one? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not fool around with another person, another, another, feller's. another feller's gal, right? That's, that's from the hillbilly Ten Commandments. <laughs> but thou shalt not commit adultery. That's one of the big ten, right? And so Jesus says, listen, okay, let's play your game. The standard is the Ten Commandments. So what does Jesus do? Jesus stoops down and with his finger began to write on the ground. I think this is so insightful. At least I'm going to share with you what my perception of this is. When was the last time that the finger of God, that the finger of God reached down and wrote on the ground? Okay, that's one place, yeah. But let's go to the very first place in Exodus chapter 20 when Moses is up on the mount because you see there, so they're saying, Moses, you, you, sat, you went up on the mountain and the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments and this is one of them, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what does Jesus do? Jesus gets on the ground and he takes his finger and he begins to write what do you think he's writing? 
You see, he's saying the standard that you want to use to accept others is the Ten Commandments. So let me write a few of them down for you. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. I believe the first one that he wrote on the sand was, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And I'm sure that every one of the scribes and Pharisees were going, yes. But then he, he didn't stop. He continued to write. And the same standard that they used to condemn this woman began to convict and condemn their own hearts. Are you all following me? So my question is, well, let's finish. But when they persisted in asking, or he stooped down and wrote, verse 7, but when they persisted, persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So he said, we'll play by your standard. This is the standard. Now, he who's without sin, he can cast the first stone. I can see him lining up. Not. There was only one person there that was qualified to grab a stone. Only one. Do you, do you know who? Jesus. Jesus was the only one, if the standard of accepting and condemnation was the law, Jesus was the only one who had a legal right to grab that stone and throw it. And so he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. This is probably when he wrote the rest of the ten. And when they heard it, see he was writing on the ground, but they heard something. They heard their own conscience, their own, their own the voice of their own spirit began to condemn them. And they, beginning with the older ones, began to go out, and he was left alone, and the woman was there in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. That is such a powerful story. How does this translate into the world and the community that we live in today? What does this have to do with creating a culture of hospitality? Are we on, as Christians, are we on a witch hunt for sinners? Are we on a witch hunt for individuals who are committing adultery? Are we on a witch hunt, let me get real personal here, are we on a witch hunt for homosexuals? Are we on a witch hunt for drunkards? Are we on a fill in the blank with your favorite sin? As a church, are we creating a culture of hospitality or are we on a witch hunt for sinners? Okay. Kind of quiet in the house here this morning, but sometimes you have to go here. Sometimes you have to go here. Do we judge people as Christ judged them or do we judge them as the religious leaders? Do we judge people as Christ judged them on the cross? Can I tell you that this building is not the church and this building will never show hospitality? People will never come in and just say, man, I just feel so loved. God wants to create a culture here. Not just here, but in our hearts. Because you see, we can accept people they come in here, but where are we when we meet people on the streets? What happens when you meet an individual who's caught in the act of your favorite sin? Or you find out that they're a sinner? I'm telling you, God has a way of working with the hearts of individuals. The Bible says very clearly, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. 
It's the goodness of God that causes us to change the way we think. Not just us, but the sinner too, all right? How many of you know that in your own life, it's the goodness of God that caused you to change the way you think? We're changed by His goodness. We're changed by His love. Do we love sin? No. Do you think that Jesus loves sin? With the woman caught in the act of adultery, did he condemn her? No. Did he love her? Yes. Did he sanction her sin? No. You see, this is, there's a line that we've, we've got to begin to identify. Do we love sin? No. Do we love the sinner? Yes. Even as Christ did, and I believe that Acts chapter 8 gives us the perfect picture of how to demonstrate the love of God. How did Jesus love this woman caught in the act of adultery? He valued them, valued her so highly that he lost sight of himself and willingly and joyfully gave himself for them without regard for his own reputation. Okay? That's how Jesus walked this love out. And you see, when that's what our heart is, when we know that we're accepted in the beloved, and it's beyond just mental assent, when, when that's a, a, a solid foundation in your life, then you're not going to be rocked off your boat when you meet somebody that's a sinner in the world. But if that's not a solid foundation in your own life, you're not going to know what to do. You literally won't know what to do. And you'll say, well, I think the Bible says stone him. And I want to be obedient to God, so, I mean, I really don't want to do this. If it, if it was just me, I'd, I'd accept you, but you know God doesn't because that's a sin. So I regret this, but, but hand me a rock. <laughs> you see, if our heart is that way towards a person, why don't we understand the heart of God any better? Why don't we understand that as individuals in Christ, we're accepted in the beloved, but from that place, every one of us is on a journey of transformation. Every one of us. And that transformation comes from a revelation of the goodness of God. Amen? So the price has already been paid. God's love has already poured out. Romans 8. One says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for those who are accepted in the beloved. There is no condemnation, but as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So if you're a son of God accepted in the beloved, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not going to lead you into sin. Right? And if he does, then when we come to individuals, we don't come with a, with a whip and a chain, but we come as brothers and we come with the word of God and we steer a brother and sister and we instruct them in the way they should go. Okay? How many of you think that your approach makes a big difference? Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Paul said, I don't know any man according to the flesh. Okay? There is a place where we begin to see people the way that Christ does. Amen? In order to develop a culture of hospitality, we have got to choose others. And we just can't choose people that are easy to choose. We've got to choose people who have cooties. <laughs> right, right, right. We've got to choose the unlovely. Why was it that Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
Did he love them more than he loved the religious people? No, he just had a different standard and the religious people couldn't accept it. It was his goodness, it was his love that caused many of them to follow him and to change. And not everybody changes on a dime. How, how many of you are still a work in progress? All right. I'm f- almost, gosh, it's scary. I'm going on 40 years on this journey. And the, and the knife is still sharp. <laughs> He's still working on me. <laughs> Not to be. <laughs> I don't even know how the rest of it. The sun and the, yeah, it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, but he's still working on me. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> so if he's still working on you, why do we only give some other people a day to get their act together? All right? If he's still working on me, he's still working on you. <laughs> All right? And iron sharpens iron. Listen, there's a culture that God wants to create. And I hope this morning challenged you on some levels. It challenged me. I mean, we're hitting right up against some big religious topics, you know what I'm saying? But do we want to really have the heart of Christ? Then we've got to lay everything aside. We've got to see people the way that Jesus does. We've got to be able to embrace people who are the adulterers of our day. And we've got to be able to love them And recognize, listen, if the standard is the law, the Bible even says in Romans chapter 4 that the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no violation. So we need to recognize that the law had a purpose. The law was to bring us to Christ. But now that we've received Christ, we're not under the law. Now we're the beloved. Now we're in relationship. Now we're led by His Spirit. And there's freedom. Not freedom to sin, freedom from sin. Okay? There's freedom to love without restriction. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. All right, guess what? We're all going to have an opportunity to practice this this week. (laughs) All right? Don't you love this? God is creating a culture of hospitality because he's the potter and we're the clay and he's saying, this is an area that I'm wanting to focus on right now. It's important. Amen? Because he's still working on me. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we just want to God, we want to examine our own hearts this morning and come to the stark reality, Lord, that there are times in my life and in my walk where I've not always acted the way that you do. There have been times where in my heart I thought that I was so right, but in my so rightness I was so wrong. There were times, Lord, when I I looked at people and I judged them because that's what the media and everybody else says we're supposed to do. And I've I've been so thankful that I've not liked everybody else. And I've not loved, Lord God. But I just want to take this time to repent. Change the way I think. God, I pray that you would so baptize us in our love, in your love. I pray, Father God, that, Lord, that our revelation of who you are will go so much deeper than just the mental understanding of what the Bible says. But Lord, that every individual who's here today, and Father, every individual, Lord, that we meet, God, I pray that at a core level, Lord, that we would know that we are your beloved. We're accepted in Christ on our good days and on our bad days when we're feeling like a million bucks and when we're feeling like a $2 bill. God, it has no no relevance on any level of our acceptance, of your overwhelming pleasure to just lavish us with your goodness, 
to lavish us with your mercy just like you did the woman caught in the act of adultery and to lavish us with your love. God, I pray that your love would be shed abroad in our hearts today by the Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would recognize that we are that temple. And Lord, everywhere that we go, we represent your heart. God, give us the boldness to stand up and to to be your ambassadors in the world today. Lord, you need ambassadors. And Lord, we want to roll out the red carpet for sinners. We want to roll out the red carpet for those who aren't like us. Because Lord, it's the only way that they're going to know your love is if they rub shoulders with the Son who lives and abides inside of us. God, we want to say yes to you. We want to say yes to sinners who are lost. God, we want to afford the same grace to others that you have afforded to us and that you continue to bestow upon us every single day. So, Father, today we we put the line in the sand. Or maybe we get rid of the line in the sand. Maybe that's what we do. Lord, we want to accept others as you accepted us. And, Lord, in that experience, we want to say no condemnation sort of way. God, teach us how to say, go and sin no more. Help us to find the greatest pleasure in 